This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi everyone, I'm Talia. And I'm Tanya. And together we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi, Tanya. Hi, Talia. Welcome back, everybody, to this week's episode of Crimes and Consequences. This story was written by one of my favorite people in the whole world, my sister Shayna. Hey, Shayna. She loves true crime, so she did all the research for this, and she did, like, almost all of it, actually. <laughs> and it's a crazy story I'd never heard before. It's horrible. Oh, great. I'm going to warn you all in advance. There's a little bit that's gruesome, but it's crazy. I love crazy. Well, you're going to love this story then. Oh, I love crazy, but it's so wrong to love crazy. Girl, everybody's crazy. I know. Before I start, I want to ask everybody to hit that subscribe slash follow button on whatever app you're listening to. And with that, I am ready. Let's do it. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little background. This story sounds like it's straight out of the medieval times, but it actually occurred in 1974 in this small town in the north of England called Asset. Asset was a fairly quiet town, and it was just known for its wool and textile industries, as well as its nonconformist religions. The population only had about 20,000 people, a little less, so it's really small. But it had seven different churches, each with its own particular identity and beliefs, and some were more radical than others. That is quite a few churches for only 20,000 people. Well, I think the point of it is they were all different, and some of them were a little bit strange, (laughs) for lack of a better term. In 1974, Asset was the home to the Taylor family. Now, we have 31-year-old Michael Taylor. He's the dad. His 29-year-old wife, Christine Taylor. And together, they had five young sons. Holy cow. Yeah, that's a lot. By all accounts, they were a normal, happy family. They were well-liked in the community. They didn't have any issues. They lived a simple life. Michael worked as a butcher, and Christine stayed home with the children because she had five little boys. For real. Keep in mind, all boys. Bless her heart. Neighbors describe the family as generally kind and caring, and Michael was known as being a very loving and devoted husband. Everything was going well for Michael and Christine until there was this unfortunate accident, and I don't know exactly what it was. I couldn't find it, and my sister couldn't either. But it left Michael with this debilitating back injury. He had chronic back pain, and for those that have experienced chronic back pain, such as myself, it can take over your life. It made it basically impossible for him to work as a butcher. Oh, no. And because there was a recession in the area, he couldn't find a job anywhere. So he became unemployed. And remember, Christine's not working. They got five kids. And that was the catalyst that caused Michael to slip into this downward spiral of depression. He became withdrawn, and he didn't participate in any of the usual activities that he did with his friends and his family. And his change in behavior was so noticeable that it was really concerning to people. In an effort to draw him out of this funk, a family friend named Barbara Wardman, she urged Michael and Christine to attend a weekly prayer meeting with her. The Taylors weren't religious. They didn't go to church. And they certainly didn't have any devout faith. They weren't Christian. They weren't anything. However, they did agree to try one meeting, just one, for Barbara just to appease her. The prayer group they attended was called Gauber Christian Fellowship Group. And it was led by a 22-year-old lay minister named Marie Robinson. So she's 22. Wow. Very young. Leading this Christian fellowship group. Marie and her group were part of a, quote, splinter movement, which was part of a larger Christian fellowship known collectively as the Charismatic Christianity. I have never heard of this group. Me either. 
Their practices were a bit unconventional. Oh, I can't wait. And some might consider far out there, erratical, if you get what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Now, as I said, the minister is Marie Robinson. She had quite a personality. She wasn't your conventional preacher. She believed she possessed special healing powers through the Holy Spirit. And she frequently performed healing rituals for the parishioners. She also spoke in tongues, which is known as glossolalia. I didn't know that. And that was a prominent feature of the charismatic movement. On a number of occasions, Marie performed unsanctioned deliverances or exorcisms. These were rituals that usually required extensive training and the approval by the church. But Marie, she didn't care. She thought she was qualified, and so she did some exorcisms. Just without the church knowing. She didn't On the side. Uh, Yes. Yes, on the side. On the side. Marie was a very vivacious and attractive woman, and Michael was immediately captivated by her. And so was Christine, actually. She was really impressed with Marie. In fact, the Taylors were so completely enamored with the entire prayer group, and I don't know how big this prayer group was, but they were so enamored that they actually converted to Christianity after their first meeting. Wow. So you can tell Marie's got a very powerful personality. They were like, sign me up. Exactly. Mm Mm-hmm. Over the next few weeks, Michael and Christine became really enthusiastic members of this church, and they attended every event, and they even began hosting group meetings at their family home. During the meetings, the congregation and Marie noticed how Michael's back injury was really affecting him. Marie knew that he was depressed about not being able to work, and she took it upon herself to heal Michael with her powers. I was wondering when she was going to get around to it. Yeah, the two began meeting privately, Mm. regularly. They would hold private prayer sessions where they spoke in tongue together. On one occasion, they spent the entire evening together, kneeling over one another, making the sign of the cross for about eight hours. What? Yeah. Like they were like making a tea with their bodies? Kneeling over each other, making the sign of the cross for hours and hours and hours. I guess that's how she helped heal him. Wow. Did it work? Well, I wouldn't be telling the story (laughs) if it worked, would I? That's true. (laughs) Spoiler alert, it didn't work. (laughs) On one occasion, Marie attempted an impromptu exorcism on another group member at a meeting during the Taylor's house. And this is how it went down. The night began with Marie conducting a normal service in front of the congregation. And when we say congregation in this story... I mean, it's at the Taylor's house, so I don't know how many people are in a congregation. I mean, I've been to church. You've been to church. We go to church sometimes. And I think of a congregation as a large group of people. Like hundreds. Yes, but I don't think that's what's going on at the Taylor's house. During her service, Michael began behaving strangely. He was shaking violently, almost as if he was possessed. This caused another member of the congregation, her name was Mavis Smith, to begin crying uncontrollably, and basically she started having a meltdown. And Mavis's meltdown triggered Marie, who began shaking all over. So you got a whole bunch of shaking going on and (laughs) meltdowns and weird, erratic behavior. To Marie, the shaking, that was a sign that the Holy Spirit was calling her to cast out the demons from Mavis's body. Not Michael's, Mavis's. Because Mavis was having that meltdown. And that's when the impromptu exorcism began. Right there at the Taylor's house. (sighs) And I don't know where the Taylor's five little kids are. Marie knelt down in front of Mavis and began praying in tongue. At one point she was yelling. And Mavis began squirming and twisting uncontrollably. She started yelling to Marie that she hated her. And she started cussing her out and said, I want to be left alone. Later on, Marie is quoted as saying about the event. Quote, I started shaking, which for me usually means that the Holy Spirit is very active and his power is ready to be used in one direction. I felt if only this power was for Mike because I knew he had a bad back and he was depressed because he couldn't get a job. But she ended up using it on Mavis. Hmm. And then Michael joined in for a little bit. I think she started to try to use it on Mike. 
but it was meant for Mavis. Okay. okay? So you okay. see where see where we're going. Okay, this mm-hmm. is all fucked up. Right. Michael soon became obsessed with Marie. And the increasing amount of time that Michael and Marie spent together didn't go unnoticed by Christine. Plus, his behavior towards her changed. When he was home, he was withdrawn. He was sullen. He was argumentative. And he would lash out at the kids and her for anything. Hmm. Christine became suspicious that there was more than prayer going on between Michael and Marie. She believed they were having an affair. And instead of, like, taking her husband aside and talking to him about it, she chose to confront Michael and Marie publicly. Oh, shit. At a prayer meeting in front of the congregation. Oh, boy. Accusing them of having a carnal relationship. Michael, his reaction was really weird. Instead of, like, being upset with Christine, he ended up turning to Marie and attacking her. He started yelling at her, screaming at her. He slapped her. And as one parishioner described, Michael, quote, crouched over Marie like a lion about to devour its prey. Now, there's different accounts as to what was going on with Michael, but from my sister's research and mine, it seems likely that Michael had earlier professed his true feelings to Marie, and she rejected him. She shot him down. So perhaps the combination of that rejection and the public embarrassment in front of his brand new social circle caused him to snap. For whatever reason, he just went batshit nuts. And like I said, he just started attacking Marie. He had to be physically restrained by other people. And eventually, though, he calmed down. Later, Marie had this to say about the evening. Quote, I suddenly glanced at Mike and his whole features changed. He looked almost bestial. He kept looking at me and there was this really wild look in his eyes. I started screaming at him out of fear. I started speaking in tongues. Mike also screamed at me in tongues. I was on the verge of death. I knew that only the name of Jesus would save me. And I started saying over and over again, Jesus, Jesus. When Christine heard me calling on the name of Jesus, she started saying it too. And I believe firmly that it was only by calling on his name that I was not killed by Michael. Wow. Michael later claims to have no memory of his attack on Marie, which is very convenient. Mm -hmm. Before that incident, though, there were a lot of signs that Michael was struggling mentally. Group members reported that he'd been acting strangely in the days leading up to his attack on Marie. He'd been speaking in tongues more frequently. He attacked a reverend, giving him up a black eye. What? Oh, my gosh. That's pretty fucked up. Yeah, that is. He kicked a vicar's black cat from his home, claiming the pet was the reincarnation of Satan. Oh, stop it. And he started telling people that he'd seen the devil. Michael also told members of the group that although they appeared fully clothed to him, he saw himself and Marie completely naked, which is weird. That is very weird. Like, you all have clothes on, but... Except for me and Marie. Except for me and Marie. I don't know. It's a little weird. Mm Mm-hmm. He accused Marie of seducing him in front of his wife. And Marie considered herself lucky, as I told you, to escape with her life. The next day at church, Michael received absolution and forgiveness for his behavior the night before. But everybody was a little bit concerned about Michael. Not only did his outlandish behavior the evening before weigh heavily on everyone's mind, But they were just really worried about how his behavior was increasingly becoming more erratic. They reached out to the local vicar with their concerns. And a vicar, from my understanding, because I'm a little confused about what kind of church this charismatic Christian group is, a vicar is a title given to certain parish priests in the Church of England and other Anglican churches. So this vicar, he speaks with Michael. And Michael admitted to feeling evil inside him. And the vicar came to the conclusion that Michael was possessed by demons and in need of an exorcism. The vicar contacted two local ministers who were experienced at casting out demons. And with Michael's consent, they organized his exorcism. Wow. So this is a church-sanctioned exorcism. I guess. I don't know what the rules are to get sanctioned. But before I tell you about Michael's exorcism, we're going to take a quick break. 
The exorcism took place at midnight on Saturday, October 6, 1974, at St. Thames Church in Yorkshire. It was headed by Father Peter Vincent, an Anglican parish priest from the Church of St. Thomas in Galber, South Yorkshire, and he was known to be an expert at performing exorcisms. He was assisted by Reverend Raymond Smith, a Methodist clergyman, and a few other church members were there to witness and assist in this exorcism. Michael probably wasn't aware of the unimaginable horrors he'd endure throughout the night. According to the priest, the demons within Michael had to be dragged kicking and screaming from his body. So when Michael arrived, he was laid on some cushions on the floor and he was restrained. And I don't know how exactly he was restrained, but he was restrained. And as soon as the ritual began, he started to spit, scream, bite, thrash, and scratch. They eventually tied him to the church floor so he wouldn't attack two priests. So I guess he attacked two priests that were there. Michael began convulsing as they doused him repeatedly with holy water. And when I say doused, I mean they drenched him with holy water. They shoved a wooden crucifix into his mouth. And they even went as far as setting the, quote, tainted wooden cross that he'd been wearing around his neck on fire. This went on for eight hours. Oh, my God. Father Vincent, and so this is about eight in the morning, claimed to have banished 40 demons out from Michael, including incest, bestiality, blasphemy, masochism, and lewdness. But by the early hours of the morning, all the men doing the exorcism, they were exhausted. They were really <laughs> tired. And they knew there were more demons inside Michael, but they were too tired to get those demons out. They knew they were leaving behind the demons that were insanity, murder, and violence. But they needed to pause the exorcism so they could get some sleep. What? Yes. They're going to leave demons. Specifically, the insanity, murder, and violence demons. You think those would be the first? I don't know. They couldn't get them out. <laughs> but they were like, you know what? Let's, let's. I'm really tired. I'm tired. So let's just take this up a little later. Okay, that's bullshit, dude. No, you finished the exorcism. It was roughly 8 a.m. when Michael and Christine both went back home. What? Because she was there. Nobody knew the gruesome and violent acts that would occur less than two hours after releasing Michael. Oh, man, I just fucking know something horrible's going to happen, of course. We well, he's got here. insanity, yes. murder, and violence Hello? still in him. So, yeah, like you said, I feel like those would have been like what I concentrated on in yeah. the beginning. <laughs> I mean, maybe you could get him out after eight hours. I don't know. I've never done an exorcism. I guess I shouldn't be speaking upon it. But That's true. That's true. But, but they got 40 out. You keep going. You need to tag in. You need to tag a new priest in. Then. Right? If you're tired. Right? Call somebody off. Yeah. Say, Come on over. We got a few <laughs> right? left. I don't know how it goes. Not trying to make fun of those people no. that do it, but this is a little fucked up. This is serious. At 9.48 a.m., just a few hours later, West Yorkshire police received a call from one of the Taylor's neighbors. They reported seeing a naked man walking down the street screaming about Satan and he was covered in red paint. Oh, shit. They sent a police constable, his name was Ian Walker, to investigate. When Constable Walker spotted Michael, of course it's Michael, he was curled up in the fetal position shouting, it is the blood of Satan. He seemed completely detached from reality. Fortunately, the neighbor who called the police was able to identify Michael and tell Constable Walker his home is over there. At that same time, police were also responding to a call from another neighbor of the Taylors. This call was to report loud noises, possibly screaming from the Taylors home. Those officers beat Officer Walker, Constable Walker, to the scene. When Constable Walker got to the house, he was warned prior to entering the home, quote, You don't want to see this one, son. I've seen nothing like it before, and I've seen a few. It's the wife. She's got no. He's ripped at her son. It's a mess in there. There's not much left of her. You don't want to see it. End quote. Oh, no. After saying that, that officer doubled over and vomited in the yard. Wow. Nothing could have prepared even the most seasoned 
police officers for the depravity that awaited them when they first entered the Taylor's home. On the floor of the house lay Christine's dead and disfigured body alongside parts of the family's beloved pet poodle. Ah, Jesus. Are you ready for this? Yes. Michael had ripped Christine's eyes, (gasps) tongue, and face off with his bare hands. What? Her face was literally torn from her skull. What? According to the coroner report, this is done while she was still alive. (gasps) Her cause of death was asphyxiating on her own blood. After he brutally disfigured her and caused her to die, he then strangled the family poodle and tore it limb from limb. Oh, my God. He flung blood, tissue, pieces of flesh all over the place. It was on the walls. It was everywhere. Oh, man. Luckily, probably because of his exorcism, the couple's five young boys were staying with their grandma, so they didn't have to witness any of that. Oh, thank God. I was worried. Is that? Oh, my God. God. Poor Christine. I know. I'm glad the boys were safe, though. What a horrible way to die. Yes. And to choke to death on your own blood? Because your husband yes. ripped your face off. And yes. You, I don't even know how. How does one take one's tongue off? I don't know. I don't want to talk about it. I don't know. I don't know either, but it was gruesome. I told you it'd be gruesome. Yeah, fuck. Police Constable Ian Walker would never forget the day he entered the Taylor's home. And to this day, it still haunts him. He's human, right? After he retired, in an interview, he said, quote, Of all the incidences in which I was involved in for 30 years of police work, nothing affected me like this one. The stupidity and futility of it all, the complete and utter waste of life, destruction of a family, not to mention the death and other traumas are far beyond anything else I've ever come across. I bet. Yeah, no shit. Wow. Obviously, investigators knew that Michael was responsible. And when he was arrested, he exclaimed, Released! I'm released! It's done! The evil in her has been destroyed. He was immediately taken to Broadmoor Hospital. It was a high-security psychiatric hospital. Well, he awaited trial. And he stayed there. And his trial didn't occur until March of 1975. His defense argued the blame was not on Michael. And that he would have never committed these crimes if it hadn't been for the actions of the prayer group and the priests. They didn't try to blame it on demons, did they? No, they blamed it on the horrific exorcism he went through. His attorneys argued that the group took advantage of his already very delicate mental state. His attorney said, quote, neurotics, feeding neurosis to a neurotic, ended up turning him into a homicidal maniac and... Let those who are truly responsible for the killing stand up. We submit that Michael Taylor is a mere cipher. The real guilt lies elsewhere. Religion is the key. End quote. His attorneys got expert opinions from two clinical psychiatrists, including one, his name was Dr. Patrick McGrath, and he was a superintendent of the Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital. He testified that Michael had been brainwashed during the exorcism, and his actions were a direct response to the torment he was put through the night before. But why would he take it out on Christine? I think they're trying to say that he was already messed up. Yeah. And they just he lost him. his mind. Yeah. They left him with I was going to say, I mean, they did murder and violence. Violence. So. And they did plant the seed for that. And if he was in some delusional state and really believed that... Yeah, I mean, I I kind of get it. I get it. I mean, I get it. I would make that same argument. Yeah, for sure. God knows we've made some shit arguments before in our career. My friend, polish that turd. Another psychiatrist, his name was Dr. Hugo Milne, echoed his opinion. He believed Michael had been placed in a hypnotic or dissociated state during the ritual and would never have committed those acts if it hadn't been for the exorcism. The church's response to these accusations was that Michael's actions only further proved he was possessed by demons. Okay. I mean, what are they going to say? Right. Well, Michael was found not guilty by reason of insanity. Wow, really? Yeah, he was found to be insane at the time he committed the murders. 
He was detained at Broadmoor, that psychiatric hospital, for two years, during which he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Oh, okay. He was then transferred to the Bradford Royal Infirmary, where he stayed for an additional two years before being released from the system. He served a total of four years for the murder. Wow. Michael's life, there wasn't a lot of information on what happened to Michael after his release. There's not much, but we do know that he was hospitalized for attempting suicide on at least four occasions. Oh, that's really sad. Don't know what happened to his children. But in 2005, so remember this story took place in 1974. In 2005, he was arrested again. This time, it was for inappropriate touching of a teenage girl. Oh, man, really? He turned out to be a fucking creeper, too? Yes, he's a creeper, too. (sighs) His friends and family claim around the time of his 2005 arrest, he began acting strangely like he had been acting prior to the exorcism. And once again, he was sent to a psychiatric facility where he served time for that inappropriate touching of a teenage girl. No one involved in the exorcism faced any charges in the death of Christine Taylor. In fact, the man in charge of the exorcism, Father Pete Vinson, received a promotion the next year. However, you can imagine that this case was very widely covered by the press, and it brought attention to society about more concern over the practice of exorcism, at least throughout England. And if anybody wants an exorcism, At least in the Anglican church, it must first be vetted by a panel, which includes a medical psychiatrist prior to approval. So that is... What? (laughs) Yes. So that is the story. So they have to make sure that you're sane before, that that you're really truly possessed by a demon and not like suffering some sort of mental... Illness? Is I don't that know what it means. I, I don't. I don't know. I'm confused I don't know. about my why... sister wrote this one up for me. <laughs> why would they need to include psychiatric doctor? I don't know. That's kind of weird. The whole thing is weird. The but whole anyway, thing's weird. Yeah, it's very. Thing's weird. It's very tragic. It's a whole family oh, that was terrible. destroyed, and poor Christine. And yes. So that is the story. I don't want to thank Shayna again for writing that up. And I know that some of the sources she got were like from dreadcentral.com and unexplainedpodcast.com. And I'll list the rest of the sources in our notes. Wow. That was a really weird story. Yeah. Very sad. Very strange. Very strange. I never knew that one. I didn't either. No, but thank you, Shayna. Thank you, Shayna. And thank you guys all for taking the time to listen to this interesting case. If you want to see some pictures, you can go to our website, crimesandconsequences.com. There we have merchandise and all of our episodes are there. You can also find us on social media. At at Hardcore Hardcore, True Crime. Hardcore True Crime. (laughs) And we also have a Patreon, as you all know, that have been listening to us. You can go to patreon.com slash TNT Crimes. There you can find a whole bunch of exclusive episodes. For our members only, you can also get the same episodes on our Apple channel. And you get early releases of episodes like this one. Yeah, and ad-free. Ad-free. So if you are so inclined, give it a look. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Doesn't hurt. No. Takes 10 seconds. Do it. Do it. Anything else? Nope. I want to thank you guys all for listening to us. Yes, thank you everyone. And until our next episode. Don't kill each other. Bye. Bye.